Hello and welcome to the Just In Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again on the program today. Uh, I just want to give everyone a reminder that Justin Center as an organization uh, is supported by donors. We are continuing to look for donors to support the work that we do. Uh, the way that the way that things run now, our budget is pretty tight in terms of, of what money is is coming in. We have a number of projects, translation projects that we'd really love to do, uh, but we do need some more support in, in order for us to be able to do that. So uh, any kind of gift that you can give is really appreciated. You go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page there. You can give a one-time gift or you can give a monthly gift through Patreon or through many other places as well. Um, well, I as I've been... Um, you know, looking through my old podcasts, <laughs> uh, trying to figure out, you know, what things I want to do and what things I want to prioritize. Um, something that I've, you know, I've gotten a lot, number of comments, people saying, you never finish the series that you start or you take too long between things. Uh, and <laughs> it's something I'm trying to, to remedy. So I'm kind of going through a bunch of the series that I started and say, and, and trying to figure out, prioritize, like, when do I actually finish this? I want to, uh, I want to actually finish some of the podcast series that, you know, I've kind of left, left without without a final uh episode or two episodes or whatever it is that i that i meant to do um and and i have some new series i want to do i started the christology one and there's some there's a series i want to do um dealing with christ and culture issues and before though i continue with those i figure i should probably get some other stuff out of the way and, and finish up some things that i had been doing and i keep getting comments and requests uh, about a number of those issues. And one of those is, of course, the Michael Heiser responses. Now, I did two of those responses. The first was just generally what some of my issues with, with Heiser's thesis are and, and some areas that I think that he isn't quite as compelling as a lot of people seem to, to, to find that he is. And then on, on the second program that we looked at, um, we looked at Heiser's view of, of the Nephilim, which is really foundational for his theology in many ways. And so I looked at some of the arguments that he used and tried to present an argument for the Sethite interpretation of the Nephilim as at least a, a rather plausible interpretation. And that, that is the interpretation that I, that I tend to take. So I did both of those things. Now, I, there are two other subjects that I really wanted to get into on, on future programs. One of those was just getting into a couple of the other texts that uh, deal with the Nephilim, specifically how we look at the New Testament, the comments from both Jude and Peter, and looking at those in, uh, you know, in light of what Heiser has said and say, do those prove the supernatural uh, Nephilim hypothesis? Do, do those texts draw specifically upon Enochic literature in such a way that they affirm what Enoch said about the supernatural element of angels and demons coming together to create uh, the, the creatures that we know as the Nephilim. So I do want to do that. And the second thing I wanted to do was just spend some time looking at alternative takes to some of the general ideas it, that you find in Heiser. So I asked the question, well, how have other Old Testament scholars dealt with some of these major questions? Things like the heavenly host and the, the angelic, the name Elohim and how the name Elohim and title is used for Yahweh as well as possibly for angels. Um, so what I'm going to do on this program is the second of those. So I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to be looking at some alternatives to Heiser's approach generally. And then I'm going to do one final program getting into the question of the New Testament use of, of these Enochic traditions and ask the question, is it the Watcher tradition that they're drawing on? If you're not familiar with any of that, what I'm talking about here, you probably want to go back and watch the first two or listen to on your podcast app, uh, the first two programs that I did. Um, so what I'm going to be doing uh, then on this program is, is looking at just some other approaches to say, how else can we approach? What are some alternatives to Heiser's approach? Now, even if you don't, you know, if you agree with Heiser, you know, that's fine. But uh, I, I think that it would behoove you to just take some time to look at what are some some alternatives? How how have others understood some of these texts as well? Because I just just in what I've, I've encountered by a lot of in a lot of people who have you know gotten really uh, influenced, who have been really influenced by Heiser and, and who have read his work and, and been convinced, is that there are a number of things in the Old Testament that it, that seems like 
a lot of these people just hadn't even really considered before. And the influence and impact of Heiser is that like he's drawing on these things that they had never even heard, which is good. He's pointing out parts of scripture and elements of scripture that they've just kind of neglected or just hasn't really been emphasized. Um, but a lot of these individuals that I've seen influenced by Heiser haven't really gone back and looked at some of the older scholarship dealing with these questions to say, well, what did people actually say in the past about these things? And I think it's important to do that because we can weigh the arguments for and against these different perspectives. And I think that there are rather compelling arguments for the other position as well, not just Heiser's approach. Uh, and I don't take Heiser's approach, so and you know that from the other programs. <laughs> but uh, I do think he has some good arguments and some compelling arguments for certain aspects of, of the approach as well. Uh, one thing I do want to say, um, you know, a lot of Heiser's, and I thought about doing a whole program on this, but I don't know if I really want to. I mean, you can tell me if you, you want me to, and maybe I'll, I'll do this. But a lot of Heiser's thesis is very particularly very particularly arises from a perception of a libertarian free will and the necessity of cooperation in order to image God. So for, for Heiser's view, human freedom is really essential. And, and so when we're talking about a theological perspective, like, like a Lutheran one, which is my own, which says that the will is in bondage to sin, and we're not confessing a kind of libertarian free will on the part of the, the sinful fallen creature in a monergistic regeneration, salvation. That kind of perspective just doesn't really fit uh, with, with Heiser's thesis. So I think it's important to also recognize the anthropological differences that Heiser really emphasizes human freedom and angelic freedom as well including seemingly, at least in, in my reading, seemingly he seems to allow for, uh, you know, angelic freedom, like continually, like even today, not a confirmation in righteousness for the angels necessarily, but a continual kind of freedom for them to fall if they desire to. It's a little odd. Uh, and, and I don't know if I'm, maybe, perhaps someone can correct me because I know you will <laughs> if I'm reading that incorrectly, but some statements certainly seem seem to show that. So there's a just very obvious theological divergence there. So anyone that's coming from a Lutheran or more of a Reformed perspective surrounding human nature, we're not going to buy into that aspect of, of Heisker's work. So it's important to point that out as as well. Um, but I, I don't know if it's worth kind of getting, getting into the specifics there. Um, and there is also some stuff related to the image of God that I think is important to think through regarding Heiser because Heiser has an approach to the image of God where he he essentially says the image of God is only functional. There, there's no ontological image at all. So he's going to say that, you know, human humanity being in the image of God is about imaging God as, as an active activity uh, rather than, you know, us being in the image of God in terms of like attributes like intellect or will, memory, those kind of things that someone like Augustine would identify as aspects of the Imago Dei. He's going to see it primarily as functional. That's something that is actually really popular today in, in a lot of scholarship. So, and I think there's part of the Hellenization thesis behind that too. Uh, and, and I think that uh, Heiser's wrong there too, <laughs> but I don't know how much how much I want to get into the Imago Dei and how how he views that. But that's another important point of divergence as well. Uh, and I, I just didn't want to do a series of like you know a hundred podcasts going over everything that I disagree with in Michael Heiser. So so I'm just pointing some of these out just to say these are some of the other areas where where there would be difference as well. Um, you know Heiser also makes mention regarding the Imago Dei that he says. You know, there's no kind of partial Imago Dei, you either are or aren't, which I think is a little odd because the New Testament certainly uses that language of being conformed to the image of Christ, being conformed to the image of God, a renewal in the image of God as well. So it certainly does seem that there is a partial aspect to the Imago Dei. And and, and just to kind of summarize what what I would say is, is the correct response or correct perspective of the Imago Dei, I think there are a number of aspects of the image of God uh, scripturally that, that we can put together. Now, I do want to say, like the Imago Dei is not something that is explained in scripture extensively. Like there aren't any passages that just say, here's the image of God. This is what it means that man is in the image of God. Um, it's pretty vague. So, you know, the passages like we see in Genesis 
Um, and and the, the language of the image of God actually is not even used that often in scripture. So uh, it tends to have a big theological import. We use it a lot theologically, but it actually is not something that's really extensive biblically. Uh, that's not to say it's not important biblically, but it's not something that shows up all the time. Uh, it maybe stands behind a lot of teaching, but it's not it's not explicit. So I would say there's there's a moral sense, and I think you have to have a moral sense because what the heck else does it mean that you're being renewed in the image of God? Um, uh, but I also think there's an ontological sense because I also think that in terms of our being renewed in the image of God, there's also a, a sense in which you know our our participation in the divine glory that we see outlined in you know as part of Christian sanctification in First Corinthians. You know, Paul mentions this as that Moses was in the presence of God. It had a transformative effect on Moses's face physically. Now we have that renewal day by day. So I think that the the image of God is not not just moral in a we align more with God's law, though there is a you know transformative moral element, but it's also um, just our, our being is transformed um, in in some way. We we are sharing in the divine the divine glory. So I think that's part of the the Imago Dei. I would also say that. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's wrong to say that things like intellect, will, memory, those kind of things are an aspect of the Imago Dei. I think there there is a sense in which we, we do mirror the things that are true about God and ourselves. Um, but then I would also say there is that uniqueness of humanity in creation. This is what Heiser's really going to grab onto. And a lot of, of commentators are going to do this, in, in specifically in Genesis, uh, just because of the nature of the Genesis narrative. Now, the, the language of I image of God seems to be connected narratively to the dominion that humanity has over creation. So part of the imaging of God is humanity is kind of God's divine representative on earth. And we we work out that, that image in, in a functional way in how we are like God in taking dominion and taking control over creation because he's placed us on this earth as his representatives. So that that's something that Heiser's going to emphasize. And I think he's correct. I think that's part of the image as well. I think that is absolutely in the background there in Genesis. I just think that all of these facets, we can accept all of them and not just one. I don't see why we have to just have one. I think that scripture is multifaceted in its picture of the Imago Dei. All right. So I wanted to, I just wanted to briefly address those couple issues because I know those are things that, I, that people have asked about. Um, and those are, those are areas that, that I think are worth, are worth discussing. Uh, so I want to delve right into some of the Old Testament texts and look at a different perspective. Now, um, I'm going to be using this text um, to give an alternate approach, just so you see someone else who's dealt with these similar issues. Uh, this is Gustav Ehler, uh, Theology of the Old Testament. And this is volume one, Mosaism, and then Prophetism is volume two. These are books, these are volumes that we put out. <laughs> so you could buy these, jspublishing.org. And Ehler, I have really enjoyed these volumes a lot. Um, the older version that we put out, the I'm sorry if you bought one of the initial ones. Um, the Because the, uh, the, the software that we use to do our typesetting, does not do well with Hebrew characters. And so it, it's all kind of a mess in the first edition we put out. Uh, we fixed it, <laughs> we fixed it. Unfortunately, uh, got out before we were able to, to catch those issues. So, but it's been fixed. So if you get it now, you're not gonna have the issues with the Hebrew. Uh, we, I had to do the typesetting, you know, in another, you know, in my, my own basically, instead of using the regular software that we do that just makes everything a lot easier. Um, but you could pick up copies of these yourself. Now, if you're not familiar with Gustav, Gustav Ehler, which you're probably not, because who the heck is familiar with this guy? Um, <laughs> he's, he, he was very influential at, at the time. And um, those, so those of you who are, you know, reformed listeners or viewers who have done some work in, you know, reading of Gerhardus Voss and his biblical theology, Ehler is a, a major figure that stands behind Voss's work. And so, so Ehler is is really a, a key figure in the development of the school of thought known as as biblical theology. And you know, he's he's writing in the mid 19th century. So to just give you an idea if you if you're not maybe you're not familiar with the discipline of, of biblical theology. Uh, biblical theology was a discipline that largely arose as a kind of criticism of biblical inspiration with a lot of the initial authors. So uh, biblical theology essentially says, 
it's not systematic theology because in systematic theology you just take various passages of scripture and say you come with the presupposition essentially in systematic theology that scripture is is true that what scripture says is true and if it's all true that means it's all consistent with itself so if you're going to get something like a doctrine of the angels say say angels because that's what we've been talking about a lot um if you're talking about the doctrine of the angels say then you can go to say the book of zechariah and you can go to the book of luke and you can go to jude and because you have a view of biblical inspiration that says all these things are consistent with themselves you can take little elements of what all of those authors have said and kind of put them all together and say okay well we can kind of compile all of these things and they're all true and they're all consistent and from that we get a doctrine of, of angels we can take all the pieces from various texts and put them together um so biblical theology works works a little bit differently now from a historical critical perspective those who are who are going to be critical of of uh, divine inspiration of scripture at least in its fullest sense they're going to say that there are there are inconsistencies say between authors there are inconsistencies even within books themselves because there are there's a process of development that brings the say the torah to be what it is today and so they're going to see a progressive development of religion from the old beginnings of the old testament all the way through the new testament this often you know gets into the the graf wellhausen or the jedp hypothesis which says that you know the first five books of the, of the torah specifically are basically from four different sources and they're all kind of mashed together in different ways there's the Yahwist and the yellowhist and, and all of this and and so a lot of the first biblical theologians are really saying well systematic theology is wrong because they don't believe that scripture is consistent with itself or divinely inspired and so they create this this way of doing theology that recognizes development now from there you do have some some theologians you know because they got to respond to this and they're dealing with the same things that heiser is dealing with because heiser what he's essentially done is given a an, an orthodox high view of scripture response to a lot of the critics and in a lot of the way that heiser's done it he's grabbed on to some of the conclusions of the higher critics so for example here here's a good example and, and ayler talks about this as well um look at the character of satan and if there's a in historical critical methodology it's essentially the argument that there was a natural development of the doctrine of of satan from initially if you look at satan in the book of job they say he's not given this you know this title satan as a name he's called thus the satan so it's not a, a personal name and this figure appears to be standing before god he's kind of part of the heavenly courts there's nothing suggesting that satan is the head of demons or that there are even demons at all at this point in israelite religion that's the claim and so they would say well this seems to be kind of perhaps some divine figure in the divine court that's not necessarily an evil figure eventually this develops into a notion that there is this personal satan and and so they would say you know the job the the satan of job really is not the satan of like the book of revelation it's a totally different figure because that takes years of development well heiser essentially agrees with a, a major portion of that thesis and says well this satan isn't what we think of as the serpent or the, the, the our satan in terms of a personal name he seems to think that this satan is a some kind of figure in the divine court some kind of of heavenly figure you know not necessarily he's like a it's this is just his role is to accuse or whatever so he's not this evil figure that we see as satan that's something totally different well, i think that's a hard thesis to sustain if it with a high view of inspiration but nonetheless that's that's heiser kind of grabbing onto what are some of these historical critical conclusions but saying he believes they're true and it's consistent with you know the book of revelation so he's trying to he's trying to fit these pieces together basically coming from a historical critical training in his in his biblical theological training but saying but these things are, are true so when you look at the development of biblical theology with with gustav ehler he is doing something similar so he's reacting to the development of biblical theology now uh, in, in a critical sense now there are a number of different ways to respond to how the the rise of these movements and there essentially are are like two that show up within confessional lutheranism in germany the more 
you know, conservative form of, of Lutheranism that believes in a high view of biblical inspiration. And you have these two major figures, both wonderful scholars of the Old Testament. So you have uh, Hengstenberg, if you're familiar with the name Hengstenberg, he's got a, a series of volumes that we're going to be republishing, um, dealing with, the, it's called the Christology of the Old Testament. Now, Hengstenberg essentially adopts what is more of a view of Lutheran orthodoxy or Lutheran scholasticism in his interpretation of the Old Testament, uh, which is that the Old Testament and the New Testament are essentially these texts of divine doctrine and you can basically take just texts in the old testament and say this is about the trinity and take books texts about the new testament and say this is about the trinity kind of line them up and put them together and and so he's going to see especially you know because this is a old testament christology right so to say christology of the old testament is certainly to say there's a lot that's been revealed in the old testament about christ uh so that's in, in that perspective you're not going to focus so much on development of, of doctrine, development of ideas within, especially in ancient Near Eastern context when you're looking at the Old Testament. Um, a deposit of doctrine is sometimes the phrase that people use to refer to, to this perspective. So he's going to see a lot more kind of clear Christological statements in the Old Testament, a lot more laid out in the way that he reads things in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and Hengstenberg's work is really wonderful. We're going to be putting, putting that out. Um, but but Ehler takes a little bit of a different approach. Now these guys are both very firm in in the divine inspiration of Scripture. Uh, but but what Ehler is going to say is well, there's something true about what the critics are doing. Uh, he says the Old Testament is not just this kind of deposit of doctrine, the, though there is doctrine in the Old Testament, of course, and it's divinely revealed doctrine. Um, but he says how we read the Old Testament, you know, what the historical critics do grab onto is it is true that in some of the older texts things aren't outlined nearly as clearly as they are later on. So there's a reason, you know, for example, why the critics are going to say that the book of Isaiah, especially the latter portions of Isaiah, are, you know, was written far later than, you know, the Pentateuch or what or whatever, or other parts of the Old Testament, because, well, in the later part of Isaiah, they'll point out, well, it certainly seems to be the case that <clears throat> this is like monotheism. And, and for the historical critic, monotheism is a, is a natural product of religious development. So they're going to say there's a natural product, uh, you know, trajectory in terms of religious development that there, there comes first this, you know, polytheistic religion. They're just like another form of the like Canaanite religion. And then they're comes this perspective of henotheism that the god of israel becomes the greatest of all gods eventually that develops into full-blown what they refer to as ethical monotheism by the time of the prophet isaiah who they say is the most clear about this ethical monotheism and then that becomes the predominant perspective in the intertestamental period um, so the way that you know Ehler is going to respond to that claim for example is to say well it's true that isaiah is much more clear about monotheism than some some of the other earlier texts now he is going to point out arguments for monotheism in other texts as well so he's going to very purposefully say the critics are also wrong in saying these things are not there but he's going to say that there this is is not natural religious development but it's progressive revelation and this is the predominant perspective that we see today so this is what happens in, with Voss in biblical theology is that it's understood that god does progressively reveal more about the truths of who he is as history goes on. And so the way that he's going to respond to the historical critics is the way that a lot of people are going to respond today, you know, predominantly, is to say, we do recognize the ancient Near Eastern context of the Old Testament. We do re recognize that, you know, there isn't as much clarity about, say, the afterlife in, you know, the book of Deuteronomy as there is later on, say, in the book of Ezekiel with the you know, Valley of Dry Bones and the Prophecy of the Resurrection. But this doesn't have to be understood in a naturalist way of this is just human natural development, but instead it's God is progressively revealing more of the truth about himself. And that's pretty consistent with what we know of the New Testament. That, you know, in the New Testament, we have the, this fullness of revelation of what was in the Old Testament so that God does gradually reveal certain truths about himself. So that's how Ehler deals with with this now uh, you know you could disagree with Ehler you could take Hingstenberg's perspective 
I I tend to be actually some I, I tend to be kind of somewhere in the middle. So there are when I read Ehler, I think he's large. He's very often correct. I think, and I think he's right about progressive revelation. Um, but there are times where. I think that because of the divine nature of the text, we can go a little further than Ehler is wanting to go. And as you could tell with my responses to Heiser, I think we can go a little further as well. Um, but I think that essentially it's correct that there is this this progressive revelation. So I think that that's important when we're giving the background of a lot of these issues regarding, regarding Heiser, because we can say, look, there are people that have dealt with exactly the same questions and have come to different answers and are doing it with the knowledge of the ancient Near Eastern context, with the knowledge of what the historical critics are saying. Now, Ehler's writing in the mid 19th century, quite a long time ago. And, you know, if we're talking 150 years ago, he's writing. Uh, obviously, there are things that Heiser knows that Ehler did not know because there are there's been a lot of development of the study of ancient Near Eastern religions. There are documents that we have now that we didn't even have access to back then at all. But a lot of the fundamental claims of the historical critics really are not that different. They're basically the same. So while it is true that there's been we've there have been new findings, there's obviously been a lot of scholarship done in, in this time period, a lot of the basic underlying principles that we find that Heiser deals with are really dealt with in Ehler as well. And what you're going to find is that a lot of the arguments that, that Heiser is going to make are referenced by Ehler as existing in other Old Testament scholars. So he's these things are already a lot of the conclusions that he's that Heiser gives are things that people have already proposed in the past and have been you know rebutted by some. You may not say refuted because you may not agree with the rebuttals, but it has it has been dealt with. It largely was all done in German, where a lot of these controversies were the case. And unfortunately, you know, I've tried to, as I look through uh, Ehler's, as I've looked a bit through Ehler's work, and I look at a lot of the works that he himself cites, unfortunately, a lot of the volumes that he cites and deals with, interacts with, were never translated into English, uh, and they still are just in German. I wish I knew German. I don't. It's one of these things that, like, it's a goal in my life is to someday learn German, and I just haven't gotten around to do, to doing it. Um, I kind of hate languages, <laughs> to be honest. It's not my favorite thing to do. I do it because I because I have to, but um, but I understand the importance of it. So, I yeah, uh, if someone that knows German, you know, well, can can maybe do some examination and, and find. Give, send some findings here about some of these these texts because I would be really interested in that as well. Um, but a lot of that's not not translated into into English. Uh, and the good thing is the uh, yeah the old like scholastic works are largely written in, in Latin, so um, I don't didn't necessarily have to do German uh, to do a lot of the the research that I've done. But it would be helpful. Okay. So let's jump into then what some of the some of the arguments are getting into into Ehler. So um, this essentially is divided up into two sections. If you read the the Ehler volumes, there's Mosaism and Prophetism, and you know the reason for that is because Progressive Revelation says there are certain things that are in the Pentateuch that are not that that have not been as clearly defined as they are in the later you know prophetic tradition and others. So that's uh, that, that's how Ehler is gonna is gonna divide things up. Though he is going to say that the Pentateuch is consistent with itself, which is quite a quite a claim when you're dealing with the you know Graf uh, Velhausen stuff. But uh, first, I want to look at the the definition of Elohim. Now, this is on page one sixty eight, but this is the older edition that I have here. Uh, I I don't even have a physical copy of the newer version that we fixed on me right now i you know you'd think that because i publish all these we publish all these books that i would have tons of copies of them but i when people come visit i tend to like give away all of my books um i just i don't know <laughs> i just i get excited about the fact that people want to read our stuff so i just give it away uh but then i also end, end up missing it myself in my library when i need to reference it so sorry uh it's it's a bit messed up here but uh, okay, so it's page 168 on this version. I'm sorry if you have the other one. Um, well, not sorry if you have the other one because the other one is much better, but uh, if you can't find it. All right, so he's talking about the the, the plural of, of Elohim. Now, because Elohim is a, is a plural, this shows up a lot in, in a lot of the historical critical scholarship. So there's going to be an argument that essentially says 
Israel developed from a polytheistic religion. So the, the critics are going to say that they're like their neighbors. Um, Israel was, was polytheistic, and they believed that there were a number of gods. And so the term Elohim, which is plural, initially referenced a series of gods. Now, this became a kind of henotheistic approach eventually, where the God of Israel became kind of greatest among the gods. So first there's, the story is at first there's kind of this, there are these like tribal deities basically. So that each group has their own, you know, their own God. Uh, and this really shows up in Heiser, uh, where Heiser believes that God has, the Yahweh has essentially divided up his kingdoms it, it, of the earth in kind of giving these other divine figures or gods, Elohim, control over those other kingdoms. When Heiser does that, he's essentially, he's he's saying that the historical critics are right, that there is, that the older religion that's testified to in scripture is one in which there are multiple gods and there are gods over each of these, these nations uh, or tribes, because they're not quite really nations in the sense that we would think of it in a modern, in a modern sense, at least. So that the portions are divided up, the nations are divided up among these different divine figures, and Yahweh is only the God of, of Israel. That's his chosen portion. So that Heiser agrees with that part. And so the historical critics are going to say, well, that's just what everyone believes back in the in the ancient Near East. They all believe that they're every tribe's got their own god. You know, the Israelites, so they have their own god, that's that's you know, Elohim. Uh their their own Elohim, but they're Elohim against plural. So these are all Elohim. Eventually, the Israelites come to believe that the God of Israel is the greatest of all the gods. So this is why we talk about like a henotheistic approach. And by the way, Heiser has explicitly said that he doesn't think monotheism is an accurate way to speak of the Old Testament religion. I got a bunch of pushback for that when I said that, but that was something that he specifically said on social media, like a couple of days before I did my podcast. And I was like, okay, well, this is a, th this is a kind of a helpful way to something to, to interact with that he actually said just recently. Um, so the, the plural of Elohim then is evidence. The historical critics would say of the older polytheistic religion. Eventually this becomes the name of, of Yahweh. So let's read Ehler, just give us an interpretation of how this plural Elohim is to be understood. He says, the meaning of this plural is not numerical, either in the sense in which some older theologians understand it who seek the mystery of the Trinity in the name. So that's kind of going to be a Hengstenberg kind of approach that it's, it's explicitly Trinitarian. Now he will say that there's a, Ehler will say there's kind of a picture of the Trinity there, but not, not, not a full revelation of the Trinity. Um, or in the sense that the expression had originally a polytheistic meaning and only at a later period acquired a singular sense. For, for Old Testament monotheism was not developed on a polytheistic basis. Um, and then he goes to cite a third view of Elohim where he says originally, this view says that the one God together with the higher spirits around him uh, and he has you know, this notion of, of angels being part of uh, also fellow Elohim with Yahweh. He's who's the greatest Elohim. That sounds a lot like Heiser. Uh, and he says it has against it this general argument that in those ancient times, the idea of angels is not prominent. Now he's going to make the argument continually as he deals with what is essentially Heiser's thesis that the language of angels, if this was so key for Old Testament religion and the conception of God, it's really not that prominent in the Old Testament. So he's going to do some comparative work to like Second Temple Judaism and say, well, if you look at Second Temple Judaism, you have all of these, this development of these doctrine of angels and you have titles of angels and, you know, the, the archangels are like named and a lot of things are spelled out very clearly when you have a religion that is very angel centric this understanding of the angels having such a central role but he says you know compared to that the old testament is really pretty lacking really in what it says about the angelic you kind of have to read a lot into those texts and then he further says this view cannot the angelic approach cannot be sustained by appealing to genesis 126 let us make man since the whole of this record of creation shows no trace of a cooperation of the angels and verse 27 continues in the singular. 
and I think, and yeah, I think he's right. <laughs> so what what he's saying is like there, and this is kind of where Heiser is, is led to ultimately is that the if the us is God and his angelic hosts, let us make man in our image. If that's really an angelic reference, you don't really have cooperation of angels playing a role at all in creation, in in the account at all. I mean, the only role of the angel. You know, there's an angel that shows up to guard the Garden of Eden as a kind of warrior, but you don't see this angelic role in human creation spelled out really anywhere. And and you also don't have language that man is made in the image of the angels. So it, it's kind of a lot to read into that one text to say that that's what's going on. Um, and so this is Ehler's explanation. It's much better to explain Elohim as the quantitative plural, which is used to denote unlimited greatness in heaven and water. The plural signifies the infinite fullness of the might and power which lies in the divine being and thus passes over into the intensive plural as Delich has named it. Kayla and Delich are Lutheran commentators on the Old Testament who are like hugely influential uh, for, for a more you know, theologically conservative approach to the Old Testament dealing with a lot of these critics. So he's gonna cite Kayla and Delich constantly. And so Whitener does and pretty much anybody going after this does. They're, they're hugely, hugely influential voices. Um, so you'll see them show up a lot. Okay, so that's that's his approach to to Elohim, which is pretty foundational, I think, to a lot of a lot of the other uh, arguments. But I'm going to go to a section on the, the unity of God. Uh, so you can find that heading if you have the text. This is page 194 in this in this version. Um, Jehovah is one. Although the multiplicity of divine powers broken up in polytheism is summed up into unity in Elohim, yet it is as Jehovah that God is first fully recognized as one. And thus monotheism forms one of the fundamental doctrines of Mosaism. So Ehler's going to take a totally different approach than somebody like Heiser. And I got a lot of pushback for saying that like the Old Testament's monotheistic. And I, I was very surprised that that got a lot of pushback. I thought that was just like kind of a backbone of historical orthodoxy. Um, but, uh, you know, Heiser's really been pretty influential, I guess, in a lot of ways. So, uh, but if you look at someone like Ehler, right, he, he's a good example of someone who he clearly acknowledges the reality of angelic spirits and demons and talks about them. And he's got chapters on them in, in both of these volumes. And he recognizes that they're divinely created and God is not the only spiritual being in existence. But none of that stops him from using the term monotheism. Now, I, I find in Heiser and a lot of the followers of Heiser that I've had commenting on a lot of my work that they make they make these claims that monotheism, the phrase monotheism means you don't believe in any other spiritual beings other than God. And you're basically a naturalist except for the existence of God. So like kind of a me mechanistic view of the universe or something with God as the watchmaker, like William Paley kind of stuff. And uh, it's just not true that that's how the term was used. Uh, and this is evidence of that. Kylan Dalich used that term too. Widener uses that term who draws on, he draws on Ehler largely. Um, Hengstenberg uses that term. Like uh, the, the guys that I'm familiar with 19th century the writers all use the phrase monotheism. Like if you're an Orthodox Christian who doesn't believe that uh, the Israelite religion was just this natural development of a earlier polytheistic religion. Like they all believe this. That seems pretty standard basic stuff. Um, and you can read more of this if you want to get the, I'm just reading selections, obviously. I'm also not an Old Testament scholar. Ehler was an, is an Old Testament scholar and he's he knows his stuff better than I do. Um, so I'm not an Old Testament scholar. I'm a, I'm a systematic theologian. I'm interested in this mostly because a bunch of people have asked me to deal with it. So I am giving my thoughts. Uh, but, but I'm interested in this as like a systematic theologian. How does this affect our doctrine of angels? How does this affect our doctrine of, of God? So that's, that's my background. That's what my PhD is, systematic theology. Um, so I, I recognize I'm not an Old Testament scholar. Heiser is. There are a lot of other guys that are, you know, more equipped than I am, uh, especially dealing with the particulars of, of, um, of Hebrew and the ancient Near Eastern literature and how it relates to the Old Testament. I recognize that's not my area of expertise, but but I've got a podcast and you people want me to talk about stuff that I'm not an expert in. So just know I'm not an expert. So just recognize that. And I'm not pretending to be. I'm just pretending to be a systematic theologian who has to study the Old Testament too, because I love the Old Testament and because it's part of 
like all theology. Okay. Um, so, so if you read Ehler, you can get some more act, more in depth arguments here, which I'm really just just summarizing. All right, he is. So he's going to give some uh, some arguments. He's going to present what are some of the arguments against a monotheistic faith in the Mosaic writings. So he's talking about Moses here specifically. He's not talking about the prophets. That that's a separate treatment. So he's going to try to show that Moses. Um, believed in, in monotheism. Of course, assuming Moses wrote the Pentateuch. Exodus 20, verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods beside me, above me, or in addition to me, is placed foremost in the Decalogue. And he says there is a thoroughgoing monotheism in the Pentateuch. And then he gives two alternate approaches, alternative approaches. People who say that there is no monotheism in the Pentateuch say, uh, first, they claim that the unity of God was developed gradually from a polytheistic religion. Okay, so there's that's essentially the perspective of the naturalists. Second, that the Mosaic Jehovah, and yes, he does use Jehovah instead of Yahweh. The Mosaic Jehovah does not exclude the existence of other gods. And so that's that's kind of what Heiser's saying. Of course, Heiser's all of course saying that these other Elohim are lesser. So he's not he's not saying that they're like all on the same plane as God. There's one supreme God in the Old Testament. To be clear, because I know you're all going to correct me, and I, I, I know that. <laughs> okay. Um, so he has. Um, let's let's see. Um, I'm gonna. There's, I have a bunch of stuff underlined here. So I, I'm, and I know recognize that I don't have a ton of time to get through everything that I wanted to, because that's how this works. Let's something that I think is, is interesting uh, here is the way that that Ayla responds to this idea that the development of, of religion is you know the polytheism. This is the God of Israel. Eventually, he's he's elevated. Ayla mentions that just this doesn't really seem to fit with the pattern that we have with this kind of monotheism ish or henotheism idea that we see within a lot of other religions that are polytheistic initially. He says, in heathen religions, the tendency to monotheism appears not merely in the superiority of the supreme God to other gods, but also in the attempt to find a unity in an abstract power standing over the world of gods. As for example, in the Indian Brahma conceived as a neuter and in uh, later Greek theology, such as in Plutarch, uh, but an idea like that of Jehovah is nowhere developed from the polytheistic process, and nowhere are many gods condensed into one being. So he's just looking at, well, how, how do other religions develop? How does a kind of monotheistic idea develop, or this idea of a supreme god, or a henotheistic idea? And he's just pointing out that what we see with the Israelite religion just doesn't fit the patterns that we see elsewhere. Uh, he says, okay, if by the assertion that the Jehovah of the Old Testament does not exclude the existence of other gods, it is only meant that many of the Israelites regarded Jehovah as the only God besides the gods of other people. This cannot be disputed. <laughs> okay, he's saying like, okay, of course. Yes, it's true that as we look at the Old Testament, plenty of Israelites did believe that Yahweh was the only God. But like, duh. Uh, and, and every once in a while, you know, he's, there will be like a big news story of like, oh, we found evidence in Israel that some people were not actually worshiping just one God. And so therefore that proves that the Old Testament is wrong. Well, no, the Old Testament testifies to this all over the place. I mean, yes, the people were pagans. Often they were giving into like false worship. That, that's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of what, just what happens. Um, so then he deals with, uh, he deals with the question of like the, the existence of, these other gods in a way that someone like like Heiser would would say. Um, let's see. So he cites, he says, in reference to separate passages to which the assertion appeals, Exodus 1811, Jehovah is greater than all the gods, does not come into consideration being the word of a heathen, Jethro. Okay, so he's saying some passages that are used to say that there are many gods and God is one among many are like from the mouths of people whose statements aren't supposed to be trustworthy anyway. Um, but when it is said in 20 verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods beside me or before me, as we know in the Ten Commandments, or in 12.12, 12, I will execute judgments on all the gods of Egypt. I am Yahweh or I am Jehovah. 
15.11, who among the gods is like you, Jehovah or Yahweh. These passages are to be explained by referring to others in the same book. So he's saying, okay, there are these passages that do use the language of other gods, like don't have other gods before me. But the question is, does this mean that those other gods actually exist? These passages are to be explained by referring to others in the same book, such as 929. The earth is Jehovah's. Further, 20 verse 11, 31 verse 17. In six days, Jehovah made the heaven and the earth. Passages which most decidedly exclude the opinion that the other gods rule side by side with Jehovah within the boundaries of their own people and land. How little the expression other gods is to be taken in the sense in which the heathen speak is shown by the frequent occurrence of this expression in the prophets, whose strict monotheism is certainly beyond all doubt. Uh, you know, so there's reference to, to Isaiah here. The passages in Deuteronomy to which appeal is made prove no more than those cited from Exodus. If it is said, chapter 32, verse 12, Jehovah let Israel alone, no strange god was with them. The strange gods are called, in verse 21, breaths or nothings, which corresponds fully to Leviticus 19.4 and 1 Samuel 12.21. Compare Psalm 96, where it is said in verse 4, Jehovah is fearful above all gods. But in verse 5, it is immediately added, for all the gods of the people are nothings. Uh, and then he says, he cites Deuteronomy 32, uh, 39. See ye now that I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and give life. Further, if we take a do of you, 10, 14, behold the heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth and all that is upon it, are Jehovah thy gods, there can be no doubt that the dicta probantia, so-called, must be understood as affirming the unity of God in the strict sense. Okay. Then Jehovah was God, none but he, 435. Uh, then verse 39, Jehovah is God in the heavens above and the earth beneath, there is none but, but he. And then he cites the Shema after that. Uh, all right. So this, you know, th this I think outlines the argument pretty well. I could go and expand upon this a little bit, but I think that his his words, I think, work work pretty well. Um, so he's pointing to just the, the multiplicity of passages and the importance of looking at the various statements. So there are some statements that do talk about like gods um, in, in, some, in some way, but the question is, is that meaning that those gods actually exist or is it using those in a sense of like the gods that those people worship? And there are some passages which seem to indicate that those gods are actually nothing. They're, they're not real, they're, they're meaningless. Um, so that's at least Ehlers' perspective, and he has reasons for doing that. And I'm sorry, I can't even read the Hebrew because this is all like messed up in this, <laughs> in this, so I'm skipping around a little bit, sorry about that. Uh, but that's my fault for not like ordering myself a better copy of my own book. Um, okay. Well, then he gets to the question of the heathen, the heathen gods, the existence of the, the pagan gods. And he says, uh, another question is whether the gods of the pagans did not exist according to the Old Testament, if not as gods, at least as living beings, perhaps they existed, for example, as, as demons or demonic beings. And then he says, there is no evidence for this. He points to the rendering of the Septuagint uh, passage from Deuteronomy 32, which is going to be key for Heiser's argument. And he says, it is characteristic of the antagonism of the Old Testament to the worship of idols that the images are identified with the gods themselves, and thereby the nullity of the latter is shown. Isaiah 44, 9, Jeremiah 10, 3, Isaiah 46, 1, Isaiah 41, 29. So he's saying that that there is, you know, there's this common polemic where the, the gods themselves are, I, the pagan gods are identified with the idols. In other words, all they are is just a physical thing. They don't actually exist. So if you're worshiping, you know, Baal, all you're doing is just worshiping the, you know, the, the statue or the human made creation that, that reflects uh, Baal. And then uh, he does cite uh, 1 Corinthians where uh, 8, 4 and 10, 19, where Paul does speak about sacrificing to demons. And he says this, Paul maintains, in my opinion, this is his, his approach and it's not super clear. Not that the individual heathen gods are demons, but only that in the service of the heathen gods, a demonic element prevails. So, and and that kind of is, that's a question that I've had, and I think I addressed this before, but a question that I have with the, the Heiser approach is, do, do we need to say, because first of all, I think 
there's no question that there's a demonic element in paganism and that demons are active in pagan worship and that opening yourself up to pagan worship is to open yourself up to the realm of the demonic. That's clear. I would say that's like, oh, that's, that's just obvious and it's true. Um, but then what do we, you know, what do we mean by that though? Is that saying that there is a literal, you know, Baal is a real being, but Baal is a demonic being? I, I don't know. And I'm not convinced that that's the case. I, I don't know that scripture makes that clear. Um, is it true that because people worship Baal, uh, that then, and that's something that is, you know, they're not giving worship to God, so it's therefore wrong and sinful, that then the demonic kind of grabs onto that worship of Baal and perhaps demons do some work and, and some demon can be like, I'm Baal, <laughs> identify as, as that. And, so is it that there are demons behind paganism or do we have to go so far as to say that like the gods of all the pagan nations literally exist? Is there a real Molech? Is there a real Asherah? But they're just demons rather than gods. And that, that I really, I don't think that scripture makes that clear. Um, and that's the, the perspective that Ehler is going to, going to take here. All right. I've got a couple other things um, here. Uh, he's going to talk a bit about about angels. So this is in his section on uh, on Revelation is where he addresses the question of of angels. He references angels as uh, attend the attendants of of God. He talks about their role as you know as messengers, as also as part of God's army. So generally, and this is really pretty pretty much the classic view of the dogmaticians in the 17th century is going to be. Angels basically are warrior angels, or you have messenger angels. So you have, you know, Michael and Gabriel, respectively, kind of taking the leadership in both of those roles. And then you have the cherubim and seraphim who are before the throne in divine worship at all times. Um, but they're not going to take the perspective that there is this, that the heavenly host are literally a kind of council that God consults in order to make decisions or something. Um, okay, he does reference, you know, it's true, the angels uh, bear in the Old Testament the name sons of God. So he's going to recognize that, in the, especially in the book of Job. Um, and he, he has a, a, quite a bit of stuff to say about the, the Nephilim. And he mentions, you know, the Enochic perspective. And I think what's, what's and I don't want to get into the, the details about what he does here just because of the sake of, for the sake of time um but he cites this is a controversy in in the 19th century in old testament scholarship you know he cites that there there are a number of perspectives on exactly how you deal with the nephilim and there's the supernatural perspective that heiser takes and then there is the sethite perspective and i think what's so interesting about when i was reading through this is just how it's the same arguments that you find today. So, you know, it's and one of the comments that I, that I keep seeing from people in my Nephilim video is, but Heiser is up with to date with scholarship. Now what you're presenting is, is an older view and everyone knows in scholarship that this is wrong. It, it, that's just not true. It's not true that everyone in scholarship recognizes that this is wrong. It's not like Heiser presents any particularly new arguments. There have been people in scholarship that have been on both sides of this issue from like ancient Judaism through the early Christian church, through you know, the development of Old Testament scholarship in the 19th century. Like the, the arguments have not really changed. So it's just to, to say that somehow, you know, there's been some like great discovery. We all know that Heiser is right because he's done something particularly unique in this, in this area. It's just not true. Now you can find his arguments compelling, but that's not for the sake of his being like just up to date on scholarship and you're not up to date on scholarship if you don't take that perspective because these are the same arguments that have been going on for centuries at this point so that was really interesting and i want i really wanted to this is where i was like oh i want to look at some of the things that he cites so i can look at some of the arguments more in more detail from some of these other authors and a lot of them are only in german um motivation for me to learn german i guess okay uh and i know i'm running low on time here so let me just cite a couple a couple quick things that I think are, are important. So this is volume two, prophetism. He's talking about the host of the heavenly spirits. So here's his perspective on the questions that, that Heiser often raises. The Old Testament speaks of the host of heavenly spirits, the armies of the sons of God, the angels in a threefold aspect. 
So he's talking about, well, yeah, what are the th what's the threefold aspect of, of the angels? First, they form the higher church. There were the heavenly sanctuaries. So this is where you have the seraphim and the, and the cherubim. Um, from, okay, he says, from the central point of the divine glory proceed all of God's manifestations of grace and judgment to the world. Now here he's going to address the question of whether the angels, you know, have a say in the decisions that are made on this earth. So, uh, for example, um, let's see, this is Psalm 89. God is greatly to be feared in the council of his saints and to be had in reverence of all of them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like unto thee? The reference of this name of God to the angelic host is unmistakable. The heavenly hosts do not appear as literally an assembly of heavenly counselors, a divan, as some have represented the matter, either here or in the vision of, an, of the heavenly assize, Daniel 7, 9. So this is similar to what Heiser is trying to say with the, the divine counsel idea. The meaning of this passage is rather that the heavenly hosts, as the appointed instruments of executing God's judgments, are also to be the witness of his counsels. So too, the heavenly hosts appear, 1 Kings twenty two nineteen, Job 1, assembled around the Lord, not that he may take counsel with them, but that they may announce to him their execution of his behest. So then he cites Zechariah uh, 1.8. And then he goes on to say that the second role of the, of the angelic spirits then is to be messengers of God. And so they're heavenly hosts in, in Ehler's perspective. And you can look up all of the texts that I reference here. Sorry, you're going to have to like go back and rewind and look at it. And Sorry, that's a pain. But <laughs> see if it's convincing. Like, See if, if his approach is compelling. But he's saying they're not literally taking a role. They're taking a role in executing his judgments and being his messengers. But it's not like God is really consulting them. Like you would consult a, a council of, you know, say consult your church council if you're a pastor. Um, then third, he says the hosts of heavenly spirits are also appointed to be his attendant witnesses and partially his instruments when he appears in his royal and judicial glory. All right. And so he sees, you know, this is with the kind of warrior language referring to the angelic hosts as well. Um, then, uh, one, one final thing I want to, I want to mention here. And that is, you know, the, the role of, of Satan. Okay, so Heiser, Heiser's view of Satan is very different from the majority of Christian perspectives on Satan. And, and that's not to say that he, you know, doesn't believe that Satan is the leader of the demons. I mean, he does, especially New Testament stuff. He's, he's clearer. He does identify the serpent in Genesis as Satan, that when you first start to read his book, you kind of wonder if that's really where he's going with it. But he, but he does eventually because of the way the New Testament interprets it. Um, so there's, there's a very uh, famous, well-known supposed contradiction in scripture where we have a, a census that, uh, that that David gets of the people. And there are two accounts of this. One is in 2 Samuel 24, 1, and the other is in 1 Chronicles 21, 1. Now, in the 2 Samuel passage, God is the one who incites David to do this. And, and in the 1 Chronicles passage, it's, it's Satan. Now, this is often pointed out as like, this is a contradiction in the Bible. Is it God or Satan? They're like pretty different. So like that kind of makes a difference uh, which, which of those it's going to be. And the approach that Heiser takes is like, well, we don't have to deal with any of this at all because it could be like Satan, but Satan is not really this evil being. He's just an instrument that God used, and he's part of the heavenly or divine council because this isn't the this isn't the Satan that we usually think of as this evil evil being. He's someone in the, the heavenly courts. Now, I, I fundamentally reject that perspective. Uh, what what Ehler does is. He, he simply points out what the majority of Christian theologians have done with this, which is to say, and this is part of Heiser's overall, I think, theological project, that he is very opposed to, he's very opposed to Calvinism. He is is very adamant to defend God from, from anything evil and very adamant to support 
freedom of creatures. There, there are a couple statements of his that sound open theistic. I'm not saying he is an open theist. I, I, someone who knows him better than I have, who has listened to many hours of his talks, can I'm sure correct me on that. Um, but there are some statements in his books that they kind of get almost there, which make me a bit nervous. But the classical way to deal with this is to say that, yeah, God also is sovereign over evil spirits and that he even can use Satan, just like he uses Judas, like their evil actions to bring about his purposes. It doesn't mean God is directly causing the evil, but he does use secondary causes. So he mentions, Ehler mentions in Isaiah 19, 14, God mingled a perverse spirit in the heart of the Egyptians. So there's the demonic spirits that God, you know, kind of allowed to go do what, what they did. Uh, there's a lying spirit in the prophets, we are told, that God allows to be sent to, to the prophets. So we don't have to say God is the direct cause of that. But that's just a, it's an odd thing that Heiser does often when we're talking about Satan, he will distance that language of Satan in, in Job, as well as in these other passages. I think in Zechariah, he does this well. I don't think he sees that as the actual Satan either. Um, all right. And then the, yeah, but in the Zechariah passage, you know, Ehler cites that and says, this is, it's the work of Satan to question the forgiveness and justification of the church. This is why he's called the accuser of the brethren. So, using the New Testament to interpret the Old Testament, which is how we're supposed to be doing this thing. If if that's the case, and then this language of Satan as accuser, as we find here in in uh, you know Zechariah or or in Job, he has this kind of judicial role as well. If the New Testament uses that language to identify the Satan as like the personal Satan that we know, part of progressive revelation is we recognize that as the fulfillment of what was revealed earlier. So we know that that is Satan, even if maybe it's not clear if you just had those texts and you didn't have the New Testament interpretation, in light of the New Testament, it, it does become rather clear. All right, so I wanted to to um, just give you guys this time a an overview uh, of just some another approach. Uh, you can check out that work, jspublishing.org, if you want to get a copy yourself. Uh, of some of this, but my, my point is really just to demonstrate that there are other approaches to the text other than Heiser's that take, that know historical critical scholarship well, that know the ancient Near Eastern context, that are conversant with those things and simply don't find Heiser's arguments compelling. And the thing that I, I just find most frustrating about dealing with this, the, the followers of, of Heiser, is not so much their conclusions. Like I, I get that. And I think that these are difficult issues. And I, I've said, I recognize how people get to the conclusions they do, but it's just the kind of the arrogance that I see from a lot of these followers just saying like, you don't know the Old Testament or no, it, nobody who really takes the, the Bible seriously, who knows the ancient Near Eastern context would ever come up with any other interpretation other than what Michael Heiser has said. And that's just not true. That's just not true. So that's what I wanted to show here. So uh, I'm done with part three. I've got one more podcast I want to do on Heiser, and that is going through the um, Enochic literature and its impact on the New Testament passages in uh, Jude and, and Peter. So, all right. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you do subscribe here on YouTube and on your podcast app, and uh, we'll see you next time. God bless.